Diastetics is a company that's very much focused on helping the pharmaceutical industry manage the way patients are tested before they get their drugs. And I'm going to take you through a number of slides that hopefully will tell that story and give you some detail behind what we do and how we do it. But I'd like to start perhaps by kind of making this a little bit personal to all of us. And that I think I suspect that just given the nature of cancer today, uh, all of us in our lives either know someone or perhaps indeed ourselves have suffered uh, a diagnosis of cancer. And, and for those of you who can think of that uh, on behalf of someone else, you'll know that it is what I would describe as an emotional roller coaster. Um, uh, quite often, if I think in terms of lung cancer, patients could travel anything up to two to three years of working through various diagnostics, whether it be an X-ray or whether it be various tests, to try and define what actually is going on. Is this a cough? Is it um, some sort of a, a, a extracted flu? Or indeed, is it something more serious? And that's a typical, that's a typical journey. Um, only 8% of all lung cancer patients are actually diagnosed the right way the first time around. The rest of us, or the rest of them, by and large, have to go through some sort of a, a protracted journey. Now, why is that important? Um, I think, obviously, as citizens of the world, um, we're always thinking about how, how can we improve the way we're being tested and being managed by our healthcare systems. But one group that we have particularly collaborated with is the pharmaceutical industry. And the reason why this is particularly important to the pharmaceutical industry is that they are shifting away from what was classically the one-size-fits-all drug. So one-size-fits-all drug, so I take a statin, um, I have raised cholesterol, uh, courtesy of my father, and um, I take a statin. And, and basically, hopefully, that statin will reduce my, my cholesterol level. But basically, we're all getting the same type of statins. It's a one-size-fits-all drug. But what's happening is that the pharmaceutical industry is launching a range of smart drugs, targeted drugs, precision medicines, various names are used. And, and those therapies are really targeting particular genetic components in our body. They're looking for the particular gene in our body. I give you an example. There's a gene called EGFR mutation. Don't worry about the name. It's a, it's a, se a sequence of genetic letters put together. And that EGFR mutation in lung cancer, the example I used, uh, uh, basically about 16 to 30 percent of patients will have that EGFR mutation. And that will allow um, the medical community to target that particular patient's genetic cancer and target it well, because these drugs are, are proving very effective. They're improving outcomes. They're probably changing and fundamentally shifting uh, 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 patients. Treated and diagnosed the right way, these patients have a 90% chance of living for a lot, five years or longer. Missing them and not treating them the right way, that, that can actually reverse it. Only 10% of them will live for five years or longer. So very important to the pharmaceutical industry. A darling of the UK industry here uh, uh, is AstraZeneca. They as a company have, over the last, I would say, 10 years, shifted away from a pipeline which had lots of one-size-fits-all drugs to a pipeline which is 80% to 90% now dependent upon testing the patients the right way. And this is where diastetics comes in. We, in essence, work to improve the way those patients are tested. And I want to take you through an example here. So this is a, this is a typical pathway for a lung cancer patient. And, and you'll recognize some of these steps. It looks a bit busy on the slide, but I'll let me walk you through it. So on the left, patient will turn up at a primary care doctor. It could be a GP, a family physician. It might be a cough, it might be a pain in their back, whatever that might be. And they will, they will possibly go into some sort of diagnostic loop. Uh, they might do a lung function test, which is blowing into that tube that we've all done in our lives. It could be some sort of uh, maybe getting a treatment, and then you come back in two months or three months and the, the cough is persistent. You might be sent for an x-ray, you've moved on to the next stage. If the x-ray finds a spot on your lung, then you will be moved on to the next stage where we might be doing a biopsy of that, of that tissue inside the lung. And, and at that stage, so we're up at round biopsy, we're at that stage, it's possibly now we're in a position to say, is, 
yes, I think we're looking at an, either an early or invariably a late stage cancer. And then we move into this, this kind of area which I've highlighted here in red, uh, which is all these various different types of tests, these different molecular diagnostics that will be tried on you to see whether you're, you have one of these particular types of cancer that will respond to the drug. And then eventually that information will be fed through to an oncologist who will then apply that first therapy. What we know about cancer today is that you will feel that therapy. It's not that the therapy isn't any good, but generally what is going on is that you are moving, you're cycling through various therapies. So the, the testing continues. You're continuing to see whether that patient will respond to that drug and so on and so forth all the way around. As I said, the patients that are managed the right way in this have, have long lives. The patients that are missed along this journey will actually miss the treatment opportunity. They'll be diagnosed very late. So what we do at Diastudics is that we've started out by mapping out uh, these patient journeys. We've, we've uh, uh, brought data in from laboratories, from insurers, to give a comprehensive picture of what is actually happening. Not what happened in a clinical trial, what's actually happening in the ground. So let's think of a hospital here, the Chelsea and Westminster, what we would be doing is taking that laboratory data, making sure that we had a full and comprehensive view of all the patients who ended up in the Chelsea and Westminster. How did they arrive there? What their diagnostic journey is? And indeed, how efficient these testing, uh, this, is, this, this test is. And so what we do is we take that information, provide that back to the pharmaceutical industry, who, who will say, is, hmm, this is not good enough because we're launching a new drug we would like to have these patients tested earlier, or we'd like to introduce a new test into this, into this, this cycle, whatever, whatever it is their need. We take that challenge on and say, okay, let, let us do that. And that kicks in the second part of our organization, which is a boots on the ground service. We go lab by lab uh, to make sure that the test is being run the right way. And often, strangely, that Getting the test to be done the right way could be as simple as improving the way that the lab laboratory is running the process of that test. Or, as sometimes happens, that lab doesn't even have that test on its menu. And so we're helping to that lab to introduce that new test. So, let me summarize. We work with the pharmaceutical industry. They're launching a range of new drugs. We basically work with them to install better testing in multiple countries. Let me pause there for a second. And um, the service that we provide is a service to somewhere between 10 and 15 global markets. So um, part of my team, there's 120 of us at this stage, we're based in 17 different countries. Predominantly the US is a big market for us, the European markets are big for us, and more recently we've put a team on the ground in Asia based in, in uh, Singapore and Guangzhou just over the, um, over the border from, from Hong Kong. Um, this has not been an overnight success. We've been working in diastatics for 15 years. I think this is year 15. I used to have hair uh, when I started the company. Um, I think I've just got a, a, a probably about another year's left. Um, uh, but in healthcare, that matters. Building a trusted, reliable partner for the pharmaceutical industry is not something that you do overnight. And as you can see, the companies that are listed here uh, these are no small organizations to serve. They're a very demanding group. Uh, they are launching, as they perceive it, billion-dollar drugs, and they want to make sure that these patients are tested the right way. Nonetheless, we have built a service um, over the years. We built a kind of a, a, a data service and a fix-it service, which allows us to, to serve um, at well over 400 projects that we've worked on. And some of those drugs didn't make it to market. We still extracted some money from it. Many of those drugs did make it to market and would be drugs that your oncologist would be very familiar with today. Names like Keytruda and Opdivo and Infimzy. These are the brands that are making up the current oncology uh, pipeline. Uh, we did come to the AIM market in March uh, last year um, amidst the initial Brexit brouhaha. It was... Uh, 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 quite a, a deadline challenge, but nonetheless, we got to the market. Uh, we were two and a half times over prescribed. 
and our institutional list, which I think is available on our, on our website, are uh, many of the organizations that I think have supported high growth uh, uh, businesses. We've just completed basically year one um, of, our, um, of our kind of our life on the market. I'm pleased to say that um, uh, we, we, uh, we delivered the numbers that were kind of on or slightly ahead of market guidance. Um, and so I can tell you that we're continuing to grow. This will be our fifth year of growing just, just around 30% uh, as a business. We've been profitable since day one, 15 years ago. Part of the ethos of our business is to, is to be a profitable, growing organization. And part of that is, is really to help the pharmaceutical industry because they are looking for trusted, reliable, long-term global suppliers. That's, what they're, that, that's, that's who they're looking for. Um, let me talk a little bit about the market and the target market. Um, if I've described to you, hopefully, sufficiently the kind of the day-to-day -day job we have, there's a lot going on in terms of how the market is shifting. Today, we regard our market as targeting around 150 therapies which have a testing need. Last year, we, we managed 54 of those therapy brands. I manage them in terms of manage the diagnostic challenge. There's about another 150 beyond that, which are moving in some stage uh, to the market. And of those 150 therapies, we would be extracting somewhere between a half a million dollars and $2 million per therapy brand, which makes up the growth picture that we have today. All good. And in fact, when we look at this, this little, uh, it's kind of a wave formation uh, slide, and um, what, what I can tell you is the FDA, one of the, I think, the drivers in precision medicine, probably this year or next will approve more drugs that need a test than not. That'll be a, a very important switch over a year uh, uh, as we watch that. We've produced a report. I think there are copies of that report available at the back of the room if you want to deep dive into the, into the area. But let me take your eyes on to what's happening next, because actually that's part of our growth uh, trajectory. And what's happening next is that the great and good pharmaceutical companies, I've lifted some of them here, Novartis, AstraZeneca, GSK, Merck, uh, Pfizer, are all working away in the background in terms of new drugs which are dependent upon testing. In fact, such is the level of our knowledge uh, of the space, I can tell you there are about, about 1,000, it's 1,034 drugs that somewhere between, let's say, 18 months and 36 months will move to the market. Now, of course, you as, as investors, perhaps in healthcare, will know that not all drugs make it to the market. So we're assuming that maybe only 300 of those conservatively will make it to the market. We also know that based on some of the work that we've been doing with our pharma clients, that we can probably extract up to maybe $10 million per therapy brand, which provides us with a market opportunity closer to two and a half billion uh, uh, dollars, sorry, it's in dollars. Um, we, we operate in dollars within the company. So the challenge for myself and my team is not just to build a global service to manage 50 odd therapy brands, but to think is how do we scale the organization to manage uh, the wave of therapies that are coming to the market? Let me show you, if I can, a little bit of the data uh, that we have. and and. Um, I, I can't emphasize enough that anybody, I think, working in the, the area of healthcare data today should or, or will tell you that extracting real-world data, not, it's not data done at a clinical trial, but data out of laboratories, out of everyday clinics, is a very, very tough process. In fact, we've been doing it for eight years. We have about a third of our organization just dedicated to the extraction, the protection, the, uh, and the analysis of that data. But when we do that, what we're finding is a very, very rich seam uh, of, of insight, including, so for example, here's a map of the United States where I could take you where we logged in here, take you right down to a doctor in San Diego and show you what labs he's using, how many patients he's diagnosing using these tests, how long the test is taking to get the answers back. So a very, very rich dive in the markets. The US is where we have the richest data. We're building similar data sets in Europe and Asia. I can also illustrate to you how long it takes each of these new tests, these novel new genetic tests, to go from kind of launch 
into some sort of efficient use. And you can see there's three different trends here. ALK and EGFR, two, they don't roll off the tongue, but these are important tests in cancer, um, versus PDL1. And we know why PDL1 went faster. We know because we worked on it. We worked on it with five different pharmaceutical companies, and we continue to optimize uh, this testing. Very rich understanding of what the hurdles are, not just in the United States, but in Germany and Italy and France, and so on and so forth. Another analysis that we do for our pharma clients, very important, is what we call the leakage analysis. Forgive the somewhat simple slide here. But in essence, we, we actually calculate that if a pharmaceutical company should have tested and treated 1,000 patients, based on the testing ecosystem that exists today, how many of them did they actually get onto the drug? And this is one analysis that we did for a pharmaceutical client to say that you should have treated 1,000 patients, what you ultimately ended up treating was just about 420 patients. So they're losing almost 50% of the patients. Now remember, often these drugs are $100,000, $150,000 per patient. And whilst probably all of us in the room think that's, that's a kind of a moral outrage, uh, not the battle for us to fight today. What's important is can we get these patients tested and treated the right way? And you can see there's a lot of need to really drive better testing to ensure that we're buying, uh, uh, driving better treatment. So our data, very rich, there's a list on the left-hand side of some of the other data that we're doing. We're building the data. We have 120 million patients to date in this testing data lake. We think, but we, we don't know for sure, that we've probably got the richest or the deepest, whatever the right metaphor is, testing data lake the richest data lake in terms of uh, in precision medicine. And, and we continue to mine that data. We continue to look for insights in that that can improve the way patients are being tested. My penultimate slide. Um, I mentioned the scale. I mentioned the fact that our marketplace is increasing from 150 brands to 300 brands in front of our eyes. And one of the things that we believe we need to do is to introduce a platform now, what do I mean by a platform? We, we perhaps um, have used Uber or we're using banking platforms. And these platforms are all designed to create a level of efficiency, a level of connectedness between the various moving parts of a, of a system, whether it be in Uber, it's taxis and drivers with customers. So we conceive something very similar is required here. And what we want to do is to connect the 2,800 laboratories that we have in our network with all of the data that we have with the 35 ph pharmaceutical companies that we're currently working with. And by connecting them together, we can hopefully move this challenge, this diagnostic challenge, from uh, kind of late firefighting to very early planning to efficiency in terms of making sure those patients are being tested the right way. And um, we've been working on the platform in some guise or other for about seven or eight years. We've invested over $30 million building this platform. And part of our IPO money that we raised last year was to finish the last mile to put in place the IT uh, team that will put this actually onto the, the actual platform. I'm pleased to say that we remain on track to launch this in quarter four uh, of this year. And I think what this will allow us to do through 2021 and 2022 is to, is to stay in step with the, the market as, as, it, as, it, as it increases. I will, of course, end with a uh, slide. This is your pre-audited uh, data. Uh, we will have a comprehensive release of our 2019 results um, in March of this year. I think those dates are available somewhere. But I just did want to give you a sense of, I suppose, the continued progress that we've made um, uh, in 2019, which is our most recent year. And I can say that our revenue, 13.4 million, was a, a, a just under a tad under 30% increase on the year before. And, and, and that's tough in a year when you're also doing an IPO. But nonetheless, we've done that. We've increased our client base. We've increased the number of therapy brands quite significantly that we've, we work with. And I think what you see in front of you here is the I suppose a reflection of, of my team kind of functioning to drive appropriate uh, level of engagement with the pharmaceutical, client, uh, pharmaceutical industry. But I think you also see here that the demand for improving the way patients are being tested is continuing.
I'll end perhaps, I know we have some question time for questions. I'll end perhaps with a, a statement to this. I said at the very beginning that only 8% of cancer patients are tested the right way. I mean, that's an astonishing uh, statement. That's in the United States. I don't know what the statistic here is in the UK. Um, and I think we can do a lot better than that. But in order to do a lot better, you need to implement change. We need to go into these systems and provide better insights through improved data. And you need to have interventions like boots on the ground. And by working with the pharmaceutical industry, we think, we hope, I think we've experienced that they have an interest in really trying to improve the way these patients are being tested. To date, by our own estimates, we believe that we've improved the lives of, a, of just over a million patients, i.e. we've improved the way they've been tested. We can't tell you whether they lived longer, but I can tell you that they were tested better by the work that they've done. And my team, are, I think, are particularly proud not just of our financial progress, but our progress in terms of delivering real change in the precision medicine market. Thank you very much. Um, Peter, thank you. Very interesting presentation. Thank you very much indeed for your time.